episode 40, Weightlifting Life Maybe. Podcast. The podcast that is probably going to end after every episode. You never really know. <laughs> the number 40 in this one stands for the number of weeks it's been since the last time we recorded one. <laughs> It literally since the last podcast we put out, I think there's been about a dozen new weightlifting podcast uh, launched. So pretty much all of you except the core. That's a three. little dramatic. No, it's not dramatic. Go look at iTunes. Oh. <clears throat> that's well, a, that's a pretty fair, out. accurate estimate, I would say. Well, it's kept everyone busy. Yeah, I guess so. Okay. Uh, Hey guys, if you need life insurance, which you should get if you have a family and you love people in the world besides yourself, uh, go to healthiq.com slash catalyst to see if you qualify and get a free life insurance quote. Um, they provide lower life insurance rates for health conscious people, you know, like weightlifters, for example. Uh, we'll assume you're the, a, a health conscious type of weightlifter. Not like the the good old 90s weightlifters who basically just did nothing but search out all-you-can-eat buffets every day after training. Um, HealthIQ.com slash Catalyst, they'll, they'll give you a little quiz thing and uh, see if you are a healthy person who they can give better rates. And then you'll be all set and everyone will love you for it. Ursula, welcome home for like the 40th time in the past month. I only went out of the country once this month. It was for a, quite a while though. We were gone for about a week. <laughs> I was gonna say it's only the fourteenth, so <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Well this was um I think this is I'm um, looking back. Hold on before I talk. It's the first international trip this year. So it was just a, it was a big one. So we went to the Faj Cup in Iran, uh Derek and I. Um and uh which he won it was, gold right he won gold it was um it was a interesting um event we had some um, obstacles um they didn't have tub which is the normal method for making weight that we use there was a little uh, debacle with the sauna uh, uh, on the morning of um that made it a little difficult making weight but he he made it and it was fine. Um, it was kind of ironic because the sauna that we'd used the night before, he had used the night before, which was apparently just, you know, really, really hot. So we had allotted the amount of time that we thought was necessary for his, the kilo that he needed to get off. And when he showed up, um, women were using it. And because you can't have both men and women, he couldn't get into that sauna. Kind of ironic. Um, so, uh, anyways, they ended up taking him to another one, and it turned out okay. But at that time, I wasn't with him because I was teaching a women's seminar clinic workshop type thing for the burgeoning women's program that they have now that they started about seven months ago. Uh, I was invited last year before they had – when they, we were originally launching or the beginning of the launch of the women's program in, in Iran – by Dr. Ali Moradi, who is the president of the Iranian Weightlifting Federation. And I had some problems getting a visa. And, and it was supposed to be me and Jason Bonnick last year that were going to go. He had accepted the invitation to compete as an athlete. And I had been invited. Um, so we had opened it up last year to athletes, and he was the only one that was going to go. I was going to go uh, as invited to work with the women. And our we had some visa issues. And then I'm not sure exactly what happened with him. You'd have to ask him. But I was already in Switzerland, so I couldn't go. But this year, everything worked out. We got our visas, thanks to Sally, delivered uh, Friday, and we left Saturday um, a week and you know a week and a half ago um, to uh, Afaz, which is where the competition was. And yeah, I mean, they we made sure they were going to let me um, coach Derek because they had never allowed women. Uh, into any of the men's facilities. The, so we went, obviously, the first time I went to Coach Derek in the training hall when we arrived, they had never allowed women into that facility. And I, Sally and I went in to, to watch Derek train. Um, Sally Vanderwater is who I'm talking about. She went as an official. Um, so originally I was invited 
uh, to do the camp. And when Phil and I had discussed what we were going to do, and we had discussed with Dr. Marotti at the World Championships in Anaheim, we had decided that it would be good to also take a technical official because um, they needed to expand in their women's pool all sorts of ranks. Uh, and so we opened the invitation up to technical officials, and Sally was the one who was willing to go um, out of the international uh, referees that we had here in the States. And um, so it was, uh, so she went along with us. And then Derek was the male athlete that had accepted um, the invitation that we had opened up to the men to compete. And we had also opened up slots for women to go with me to help with the camp. Um, and we didn't have any uh, takers really. Uh, so it ended up just being the three of us. So it was a small little contingency. And then Brian Oliver, who, writes for inside the games and um, is doing a bigger article for the guardian uh, who is a British journalist what had accompanied us as well. So it was with us during the entire trip. Um, and then Amir who is um, a, a, an Iranian um, who lives here in the States went to help with interpreting uh, as well as just kind of the cultural uh, potential issues, and uh, he accompanied us on the trip there um, uh, as part of our delegation. And so that was helpful. He's also uh, friends with the president of the Iranian Federation, Dr. Maradi. Uh, and, and so we had met him through Dr. Maradi here in the States. So that was our entire contingency that, that went in our delegation that went. And But it was, you know, there was a lot of things that had never happened before, like an American male hadn't competed since 1965 in Iran. Um, they had never allowed women into any of those facilities. We went and watched the men's national team train. Of course, I, I was allowed to coach Derek, um, and he won. Um, the lifts weren't, uh, you know, his obviously his best lifts, but uh, we did what we needed to do. Uh, he cleaned 145 with a really nice clean on his second attempt. We did what we needed to to solidify the, the gold in total, and then went to 145. He cleaned it, uh, missed the jerk, and then came back and, and missed clean on last um, attempt. He had a really severe – he probably doesn't care for anybody to tell – for me to tell everybody. He had a really severe hand bruise, um, and his hand was swollen also from being in the sauna combined with the bruise that he had just suffered. Uh, he had a really hard time just holding the bar. And I was like, look, this isn't the time to have – an issue. Um, you've clean and jerked a national record with a forearm cramp. So you're just going to have to make some, <laughs> I mean, tough shit, you know? Um, yep. You're just going to have to make some lifts with a hand bruise or no hand bruise or no hand. You're, you're going to have to make some. So phenomenal. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's just not the time. Like I know it hurts. I, I, I believe you. I can tell by the way you're moving. Um, but you're going to have to pull out a snatch and you're going to have to give me a clean and jerk because we need a total. Uh, we're not going to get all the way to Iran. And then, you know, here's a woman coaching a man, which they've never seen. And then you bomb out and they're like, oh, yeah, women can't coach. Just forget that whole thing. Hang it up. So, um, oh, so you're like, saying it was all about you. <laughs> at I that see. moment? At that moment? I'm don't like, fuck this up for me, Derek. It. Yeah, don't make us look bad, Derek. <laughs> no, this is about us at this point. All this right. is you well, and me. Way to go, Derek. Way to pull through. Give Ursula one clean and jerk. Yeah. And, and a then, snatch. <laughs> and a snatch. Hey, all you need is one of each, really. Right. Um, and he did clean 45, which is what he wanted. He was like, put 45 on. And I just looked at him like, okay. Okay. <laughs> we like hey, 30, you already 30, got the total you needed, then why not? Yeah. Um, but then the ensuing events were pretty, uh, were pretty interesting. Um, but I'll let people read about him, uh, inside the games has been running articles and, and, um, uh, I don't know how much has been printed here. It was all over the news in Iran every single day because there was this kind of, they were supposed to let the women in to compete, uh, to watch and that was being held up. So we, um, one day when I showed up, I sat outside with the women and there was four women that were supposed to, they were all supposed to be let in. And they weren't letting them in, so I kind of sat outside with them and, uh, until they were until they let them in. So that kind of created a little of 
bit of a kerfuffle uh, because I didn't, I wouldn't go in until they let them in. And it wasn't like, oh, I'm not going to go in if you don't let them in. It was just like, I'm not going to go in until you let them in. <laughs> oh, well, I, I'm when you explain go it in. that way, it makes perfect sense. Yeah, yeah I'm just not going to go in. And if they don't go in, then I won't go in, and that's fine. I've seen, you know, thousands of sessions of men's weightlifting. They've the seen none. It isn't even that interesting anymore. Well, if you've never seen men's weightlifting and this is the first time – um, and they've never let the women watch, then it was kind of, it was a big deal to them. Um, and, and it's a big deal, just a cultural barrier, obviously. Um, but they had had permission. So it was, it was kind of puzzling as to, there was some conflicts going on between like local authorities and permission that had been given by the sports, um, the political sports structure had said, yes, they would be, I don't know. It was, it, it, was, oh, it was a little confusing really for us. surprising that not everyone was on the same page there. Right, right, exactly. And so I just, you know, I just sat with them and said, oh, I'll just sit out here with y'all then if y'all can't go in. You know, I'll just do this over here with y'all. And um, and then they did let them in after that. Um, and so... You just found a way to work the word y'all into one sentence like half a dozen times. We get it. You're from Texas, Ursula. Come on. I don't notice it, Greg. <laughs> Like you, you wouldn't. No one from outside of Texas would have said you that many time times, but you managed to say y'all like six hey, times in Mr. a row. Mr. English professor. Well, it's nothing to do with English professor. All right, just let's move on. My... Anyway, so we went and they got to watch the lifting. It was a big thing, and and then the next day they had the six and eight year olds that were in the clinic that I had worked with two days before that they got to lift on national TV and it was a big thing. So it was pretty, it was, it was pretty mind blowing actually. And, um, cool. glad I was there. Yeah. yeah. Well, it made and, history. First woman in Iran to coach a male weightlifter. That's pretty huge. Yeah. There's all sorts of things. I mean, there are bigger, I think bigger things going on under the surface to me, oh, of course. which is that this, there's a chance that it can start some sort of a domino effect of lifting for women in countries that have typically not been open to women's lifting. And that's, um, I guess, you know, it's not my place to say, but it's, I guess, in my heart of hearts, what I'm hoping to see. It's Cause I'd like to say, I hope it happens. I think yeah. it's silly. For well, it's not, not my to. place to go into a country. Um, and for, I mean, here I was invited into the country, but it's not my place to, to go into countries that I'm not invited and say, this is what I want for the women of your country. But the, I mean, the truth yeah, is, see, on, I, I mean, obviously, I don't that's have what I any compunction about saying that. I don't give a yeah. fuck. Why can't women lift weights? Go ahead. Well, you you all have my permission. Well, I want them to, but I also want to be um, welcomed into a country and, and for them to uh, get the blessing so that it doesn't, so that no one's put in jail. I mean, we found out that the journalists that we were eating uh, lunch with uh, on a regular basis in dinner had been arrested over 40 times. I was like, well, that's comforting. <laughs> yeah. Well. I was like, uh, would have that would have been good to know. Um, so, and I was like on the cover of one of the major reform newspapers. Uh, uh, and, yeah. Now you're officially a radical. Don't go back. Yeah, I mean, but that's not, you know, I don't, I don't want that kind of a, of a reputation. I want to be able to help. And if you're going against the grain like that, then you can't. And that's the problem. Like, it, things have to be done in a, in a kind of methodical and conservative way so that they take root. And so I want to be part of a process that can take root. I don't want to go and just start knocking, trying to knock down doors and barriers. This is not effective. It wasn't effective here to try. I mean, we, we did things with support of men, and that's what it, it takes. And that's just the truth. And I know a lot of feminists don't like to hear that shit, but a lot of them haven't. You know, the, those are the ones that are – those are the ones that come after the pioneers of movements that already had the support of men to make things start. Then you can get all bold and bully and bullshit and be like, oh, yes, I'm, you know, when, when the door's already knocked down. But when you're trying to crack open doors, you need men there. And, well, you, you know, a, maybe you don't have to say ahead. you need men. You just need everyone working together instead of having yeah. a bunch of different fucking factions 
throwing shit grenades at each other. Well, yeah. I mean, ending up in jail a bunch of times doesn't always move. Um, I mean, it, it, it's it's radical and it, it and it can make some effect in it. But if it doesn't move the pawn forward, then it doesn't really help. Like moving the pawn forward is what you got to go for. In my in my that's just my position. Like I I want actual progress. I don't just want action like acts of radical, um, you know, behavior that that and end up with us falling further back than where we started. I get you. Yeah. And maybe I'm just a, a different kind of feminist. I'm not sure. But uh, there, there was there were a lot of people in place already that had supported this movement before I ever went there. And there was a lot already going on. Well, so course, it was not. Because you wouldn't have been there otherwise. That's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. Hmm. And there was a contingency of women that were already doing things. Um, so... All right. Well, now that we've solved the world problem of gender inequality, let's talk about weightlifting. Uh, hardly solved. <laughs> let's go. Fuck. We can solve it in 10 minutes. It was up to us. Okay. Uh, this first asshole is named Greg, so that's confusing. Greg says, It never fails that I end up with bloody shins after snatching. When I watch myself on camera, it seems that I subconsciously bring the bar away from my knees to prevent my shins from getting flayed. <laughs> I understand that the first pull should take place with a slight pull backward, but given my position, I can't figure out how to initiate the pull in that direction. What advice comes to mind? Love the show, especially when Ursula drives Greg nuts. Greg, I'm going to let you in on a secret. Uh, that's every single minute of every single show and including all of the pre-show interaction that we have. She's driving me nuts continuously from start to finish. <laughs> no. It's not she's true. not even talking right now. She's driving me nuts because I know she's <laughs> up to something over there. I'm writing notes. Exactly. I'm that's scribbling. You. I'm writing y'all on a whiteboard a bunch of times <laughs> to remind myself to say it. As long as no. you put the apostrophe in there and don't just write it as Y-A-L-L, -L, then that's fine. Oh, yeah, I knew I was forgetting something. Oh, see? Um, Damn it! <laughs> kidding. That's All right. Well, okay, so let's figure out Greg's problem here. Uh, yes, you, you, you should typically see a slight backward movement of the bar as it comes from the floor on its way up toward the hip. Um, I, I think sometimes the problem is that people interpret that as being some dramatic backward movement. Like they're wondering how they're going to get that bar to move, you know, eight inches backwards. And it's not going to be that much. It, you know, for some people, depending on how you're built, depending on your position, it's not going to be that much. The point is that we're, we're operating under the assumption that the barbell is starting uh, over the MTP joint, as or so likes to say, or I just say the balls of the feet. Um, Possibly if you're super tall, maybe it's more over the toes, but it shouldn't be in front of the toes. Uh, and so what we need to do is during the pull, we want that bar to come back so it's a little more over the middle of the foot. So that's where that backward movement comes from. If you are, like a lot of people mistakenly do, trying to start with the bar way back over the middle of your foot, um, you, you know, like you're, you're standing tall rolling the bar all the way back to your shins and then trying to get into a start position without letting your shins incline forward, you're not going to get any backward movement out of it and you're going to flay your shins. Um, so you may not be doing something that extreme, uh, but that's a, that's a pretty common problem to see. Uh, the other thing too is that, you know, we, we focus so much on, on, keeping the bar close to the body and moving the bar back in toward the hip that again a lot of times that gets over exaggerated and you have to understand that if you are pulling from the floor with your shoulders approximately above the bar or very slightly in front of them uh, the bar doesn't need to go back much you know what I mean like you don't have to really actively use your lats and shoulders to push the bar back towards your body because it should be naturally hanging pretty close you know it, it's a, your your arm is a pendulum attached at the shoulder with the bar at the end as the weight and so it wants to hang about straight down from your shoulder so unless your shoulder is way in front of the bar during that first pull until you're past your knees you shouldn't have to be pushing the bar back toward the body really actively certainly shouldn't take a whole lot of effort um, so if you if you find yourself pushing back really hard at the start you're either too far over the bar 
um, or you're just overdoing it and you got to settle down on that stuff and, and focus just on, you know, lifting your body and, and kind of as Tim Swords uh, said to me years and years ago, toe the bar with your body. Um, the other thing I would say too is that you may, uh, you may be starting with your knees kind of directed a little too far forward rather than um, having them pushed out inside your arms and that's going to help um, in, in effect it's going to kind of shorten the length of your thighs so that your knees will naturally be a little farther back so you won't have to move quite as much but that ultimately you know I joke with people at seminars it's like okay well how do you get your knees back out of the way uh, you know, when you're lifting a bar off the floor? And the answer is that you stand up. You know, if you're down in a, in a bent knee, bent hip position, and then you stand up, you know, by straightening your, your knees and your hips, your knees and your shins go backward. They, they, that's how that you straighten your legs. So unless you're putting yourself into a really strange position and you're moving oddly, like you're pulling your shoulders back uh, behind the bar too soon or you're pushing the bar back way too hard, Getting your knees out of the way of the bar shouldn't be um, some really complex endeavor. And and uh, I think people really overthink it and get hung up on this stuff. And then they come up with these really bizarre methods, you know, like literally pushing their knees back like into hyperextension so that, you know, their legs are perfectly straight by the time the bar is at the bottom of their kneecaps. Um, and, you know, wondering why they're having so much trouble higher up in the lift. But... Um, you know, that was my dickish response, Ursula. Maybe you could say something. Well, that's a I'm going to incorporate some of your response <laughs> into my response, which will be less dickish, I hope. Um, not, let's be honest. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, I underline the the sentence. I understand the first pull should take place with a slight pull backward. That's the bar trajectory. So if we start with the bar, as Greg said, over the metatarsophalangeal joint, as you're standing. So if you draw like, uh, just draw like a little peanut, and that make that your foot, and then at the, <laughs> a two-dimensional peanut. Yes, and then you put in the top little circle a dot, and in the bottom little circle a dot. Um, the movement or the the pressure on your foot should shift only about that much, ideally. There are some really good draw, um, drawings. You know, there's some really good uh, foot pressure charts that John Garhammer did a, quite a while ago that had him and I think Russ Pryor and Bob Heiss III. I think it was Bob Heiss III. Um, and a comparison of foot pressure charts. And we see, like, the foot pressure change when you're starting to stand with the bar. And even though there were some differences between the three, what we do see is that basically – we start with the bar over the metatarsal phalangeal joint, and as we stand, the, there's a slight foot pressure shift um, as you start standing and past the knee um, that ends up, by the time you get to the hip, with the pressure over about, I don't know, t towards the rear of the foot, but the, maybe in, right in front of the ankle. Um, so what, what I'm trying to explain to you is when you're moving from the ground to right above the knee, the bar shift that you're going to see in that first pull is going to go basically from over the metatarsal phalangeal joint to over the top of the tarsals. It's not much of a shift. And that bar moving in, as Greg had mentioned, should happen uh, due to the fact that you've just stood up. You're trying to – and I think what's happening is you're pressuring your heel from the beginning – and by doing so, as he mentioned, you're pulling your shoulders back too much. Even if your shoulders don't actually tilt back, the fact that you're driving pressure through your heel is causing the bar to actually scrape along your shin as you stand. You need to concentrate as you're driving off the ground. Don't let the bar tip you forward as you go through the, the below the knee uh, position, um, but just pressure the heel without pulling your shoulders back or dragging the bar into your shin. And you do that by making sure you continuously drive through the ground as opposed to digging your heel in, which would alleviate too much pressure from the front of the foot. That causes the bar to then drag against the shin as you stand. And so a lot of people who have that drag on the shin may look like they're in a good position when they start. They don't necessarily have their shoulders too far back. 
although people who do sit with the shin really vertical and the bar too close, as Greg said, tend to drag the, the bar on their shin because that is obvious that they're digging their heel in and scraping their shin. They have no way to, to, to continue to stand without scraping their shin. So you can have a good-looking start position yet still dig too much pressure onto the heel and cause the bar to scrape the shin. A good-looking pull would have you drive your foot straight through the ground and the bar path as it came in, the pressure would naturally shift towards over uh, the top of the foot or towards the, the, the tarsals because um, as you're standing, the bar is coming closer to you, but you're continually driving your foot through the ground. You're not dropping your hip or um, digging too much pressure onto your heel. So I think people start to get pressure way towards the back of their heel too soon. And we see this in a lot of people because they'll get to right below their knee or right above their knee and their toes are off the ground. Yeah, it looks like they're water. That feet. shouldn't happen. Yeah, we talk about that, uh, and I've mentioned this pendulum effect that occurs. That's because you're pressuring the the heel too much and too soon. Um, and, and you should never see that happen during the lift at all. You would, there's never a point where any of the foot should lose contact until you actually go to the to triple extension. And so yeah. if you feel that, that peel of the front of the foot up, that's what's causing, or just the loss of contact with the the ground as you start to as you start to stand. Um, that that will cause the bar, and that's you moving um, your mass back as opposed to up uh, as you're standing. And that is literally you pulling the bar into you as you're standing, causing the bar to then drag. I mean, of course, it's going to drag against you if you're pulling it back into you as you stand. There's also the potential that you're just squeezing your lats so tight um, and you have to learn to uh, mitigate that, the, the amount of, of tension that you create in your lat. Um, you should be able to control that so that you can hold the bar one inch from you, two inches from you, you know, three inches from you throughout the pull as you wish. That's your ability to control how much lat activation you have at any point during the pull. And as an athlete, you should be able to have control over that. So you shouldn't be like so tight off the ground that you're squeezing your scapula back and you're just squeezing the shin out of the bar and the bar's just dragging the shit all the way up your shin past your knee and it's catching your knee and, and all of that. I mean, I've seen people do that too because they're told to get tight off the floor and they don't understand that there's a, a tightness that's basically an isometric um, activation of the back um, – without actually uh it's not scapular retraction right yeah you're not pulling the bar back into you you're just holding a a contraction of the whole upper back as you stand you don't actually have to drag the bar back into you by pressing it it's not like a a straight arm push down with a pulley that you're having to squeeze the bar back in until you start moving then you might have to create a little bit of pressure to make sure the bar doesn't swing out so but the fact is if you're standing your shoulders are farther over the bar yeah you, you're gonna have to get yeah, more yeah, pressure but in that first pull knee. no yeah. yeah in the first pull it should be a little bit easier to keep that bar if you're standing correctly yeah um so exercises to try uh, number one, doing uh, like a segment deadlift or pull or a pause pull, depending on what you want to call it, um, and you know pausing with that bar like one inch off the floor. So feeling that uh, that proper start position, like Ursula was saying, where when the bar is still on the floor in your start position, you should feel pretty much balanced across the whole foot. As soon as the bar separates, you're going to feel a little more pressure over the balls of your foot, but you should still feel contact across the whole foot. And then once you move at that one inch, you should feel more balanced again. Then move up to the knee, you know, bar touching the kneecap, um, you know, feel that balance across the whole foot with maybe a very slight preference for the heel, like Ursula was saying. So the, the landmark I use, I, I just say your, your line of gravity should be over about the front edge of your heel. So, and it's just because that's a convenient landmark for me anatomically. So it's, it's just slightly behind midfoot. Um... And then another one that's probably helpful would be uh, what I call a floating deadlift, which really you could just call it a really, really, really low hang deadlift um, where, you know, first, first rep obviously is normal off the floor, but then 
on your your subsequent reps you're going to lower that bar until the plates are as close to the ground as possible without touching um, and that's going to force you to feel that position uh, where you're essentially squatting the weight up um, and so you're going to find that position where you can balance over the whole foot with your shoulder over the bar um, you know learn how to how to navigate the bar past your knees you know how your body and the bar interact through that phase uh, without falling over or tipping way back on the heels or allowing to pull you way far forward and you know dragging it and you know scraping out the first eighth inch of your shin bone um, so between those two uh, if you spend a little time uh, training those not only will you have that technical that skill practice but you're going to strengthen your body uh, in a way very specific to that position and movement so that it's it's more apt to uh, to occur naturally when you're doing actual snatches and cleans i've uh, I, i've always been um a fan of like block below the knee work and it's not applied to this particular but i want to comment because i've started using the floating snatch a lot more and boy i'm a huge fan oh yeah just works so well on so many things and that was something that any postural or back weakness that mm -hmm. exercise is going to murder you mm -hmm. and just for awareness of how you pull yeah 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 i think and, that's, and, and, that's one of the yeah. greatest things you can do is that really 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 low hang um you know for pulls and, and even lifts like early on in a cycle because it really establishes and strengthens that stuff and it'll well, show then you just where you're the up weak. and down movement, you know, having to yeah. do the pull, doing the, you know, because we'll do an initial snatch and then we'll do a couple of floating snatches afterwards. And that awareness of how you lower into that position. Yeah. So going back through those positions in the negative and then coming back through them, um, you just get all of this reinforcement, both uh, uh, going up top down and bottom up on that pull. Uh, it's, I think, really reinforces all of. The familiarity with where you should be at every position in your pool yep. um, and how to stand uh, you know right off the ground how you should initiate the drive I think it does wonders for understanding foot pressure um, as well uh, yeah I really because really, I get a lot of people that when we do eccentric pools and we're trying to teach them how to pull off the ground as well as how to lower a bar um, at, to teach the reverse of that you'll get them dropping their hip which is indicative of, of standing up wrong. Um, and that would be, you know, pulling the bar back into their shin if they stood up that way. Um, it, it, we can fix that as well. So it really does apply to how they initially stand. Um, so, yeah, I, I really like those. All right. Just in general, as a great exercise to incorporate that will fix a lot of problems. Yeah, I mean, you'll, you'll hate them more than anything when you first start doing them, but it'll be worth it. Mm -hmm. You just got to think long term. Just yeah, there are there are just a few exercises that I think as a regular part of your training should be incorporated, and and can really uh, have you get, you get a lot of bang for your buck if you're doing them, and that's one of them. Yeah. All right. Uh, Steven says, "Hey, Greg and Ursula, thanks so much for running this podcast with your busy lives. Your efforts are very appreciated. Thanks, Steven. That's nice to hear." Uh, when I'm sitting here pulling my fucking hair out for hours at a time trying to get Ursula on the phone. Uh, there seems to be a lot of good information associated with, or excuse me, associated to understanding the Russian, Bulgarian, and Chinese methodologies of weightlifting. I understand the Russians literally wrote the book on weightlifting, and there are many important takeaways from understanding each philosophy, but it seems that most of these programs are geared towards athletes with access to, quote, special vitamins, or takes advantage of a huge population to pull from. Well, I know there are many intelligent ways to integrate the philosophies behind each of methodologies without use of drugs. I was wondering if you two could speak to what you consider the, quote, American weightlifting methodology. Would you consider American weightlifting to be just that, an intelligent way to train and manage fatigue using the Russian, Bulgarian, or Chinese systems as a guide? Or is it something completely different? Do you two have a vision of where American weightlifting will be going in the next squad? Oh, that last sentence really just added a whole other thing to this. So let's focus on that first question. <laughs> And we'll see what we can do afterwards. Ah, Ursula, jump in on here. I want to hear what you have to say. Okay, well, um, I'm writing my little cycles out. And I would say that my, well, first of all, we all periodize. 
So, and I don't care what you call each of the little segments, but, um, you know, we write things with a, a, com- a competition at the end in sight, usually. And then we, I work backwards. And so my first cycle of anywhere from four to six weeks would be um, a preparatory cycle where I'm, you know, you're creating condition of the athlete, or I think you call them work capacity. I sometimes call them strength conditioning. And it's usually where we see them. I just say conditioning, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, it's just developing uh, the ability to then handle what's in that middle section, which is going to be higher intensity and most of the strength work. Um, so in that in that conditioning phase or uh, physical preparation phase that creates enough work capacity to handle uh, both the combination of volume with r- raising intensity um, I, in, the, in the initial phase, I think I, I lean towards a Russian style of programming because it's predicated on being able to do certain numbers and then predict what the, the numbers would be you would be successful with in the next week. So if I know I can do 70 for you know in the squat for four sets of six this week, then 75 um, for three sets of five obviously can also be done. And then if I can do that, then I can, I I know what the equivalencies are. And then I also know that I've done the necessary prep work to be able to go up in percentage and successfully complete at some point, if I continue uh, a proper increase in reps and sets, I can increase the intensity and be successful Um, and, and can increase then intensity reps and sets over time and successfully improve their strength. So by the time I get to the strength phase, we're hitting higher intensity successfully. Uh, so in that middle section, when we get into the strength phase, uh, which also can last, you know, four to six weeks, depending on how much time. So if I have 17 weeks to the next meet, sometimes I only have 12 weeks to the next meet. Sometimes it's less. Sometimes we don't have time to go through an entire conditioning phase between competitions. And so things are truncated. Um, and so that's one of the issues I think we're going to run into when you talk about the vision of where America weightlifting is going to go into the next quad. The next quad is going to be a little different because of the number of times that our athletes are going to have to compete. Elite athletes are going to have to compete much more. And I think that's going to be a little more difficult for coaches because we've been had the luxury of, say, um, having these 16-week cycles um, kind of laid out in terms of the amount of time between our major competitions and with some of our elites maybe having 10 or 12, um, it's been rare that we've had to compete like every eight or six weeks on a regular basis. Um, I've done it before with some of my athletes and it's rigorous and it's hard and it requires a, 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 a change in how we program. But anyways, that's another thing. Um, so the norm for me would be then to go into this middle strength, strength phase Um, where I use more of the wave system. So I use Bulgarian style training where we'll go up to, um, so by the time we get into about the second week of that uh, four to six week phase of strength, and and sometimes it's five weeks, it just depends again on how much time I think we need to spend in that phase, if this is a weakness. um, And, uh, the athlete, the specific athlete, uh, whether they're able to handle it, you know, obviously super heavyweights uh, going to really heavy singles more often is, is going to require more recovery. So we might have to space that out. But and so a lighter weight female may be able to do that more often. Um, but we'll hit the, you know, do these ways where we'll go up to, you know, they, they'll put 100 percent. I tend not to put an actual hundred percent. Um, I've, I've leaned more towards giving a number that I know they can hit. Um, so maybe we'll go up to like 95% and they actually do an actual 95% and then we'll back down to say 85% hit a single, go back up to 90% hit another single, go back up to like a 93% and then be done. So we'll do some waves, uh, training on the snatch, the clean and jerk, the squats, but we don't do that every day, all of the lifts because that would be very, very taxing on the nervous system. And because we don't have PEDs in our training, um, it would be too difficult to recover from. And the next day they'd be basically toast, even with the work capacity that's been done. Um, The next day those percentages would be lower or they would not be predictable. And so um, I'll use, you know, snatch waves 
on one day. We might do clean and jerk waves less often, but we'll do them on other days. We might just do clean waves. We might do jerk waves. Uh, we'll do some squat waves. But again, the intensity during that phase can be higher uh, more often. And then we go into your kind of prototypical or the quintessential power phase or pre-competition phase where intensity uh, starts to decrease and volume or um, actual um, load starts to decrease over the last four weeks so that the athlete can recuperate. And we start bringing in, uh, for me in particular, I start bringing in more power snatches, more uh, movements from uh, partials like power snatches from the block so that the back can start resting, uh, start giving the legs a little bit more rest to start spreading out the squats um, so that the athlete can recuperate for performance at the end of that for the competition. Um, so that's how I incorporate. And, and I guess that looks more like an American pre-competition phase or power phase. Um, so I would say that I'm influenced and the three separate phases uh, by the three separate components. Um, I don't adhere as strictly to the American phase in the first cycle. I've seen the cycles that they write out for it, and I don't do just a wholesale like 65%, 70%, 70%, you know, and then a typical deload. Um, I tend to stretch it out and do smaller percentage increases over a longer period of time because of the lack of, of drugs. Um, I, I've also found that doing the, the bigger increases like week to week is, is not as easy, but I can do smaller increases over a longer period of time and um, deload later and usually have some uh, beneficial effect. And so that allows us to get to a higher number before I have to rest them uh, or give them a week of rest. Or sometimes I'll have just days within the week that I, I bring volume down and this will allow. We also don't do... Um, and maybe one of the reasons I can get away with that as well is because we don't do, you know, 11 or nine training sessions a week. Most of my guys do, you know, four to five uh, because they work full time jobs and they have families and all of that kind of stuff. So um, I know that's that's really low. Priorities but um, in order. Yeah, they, they have. A, we've we've had to do a lot of I, I've done a modification for a working um, adults, really uh, lifter that most people would say, oh, that's the program for a recreational lifter. But it's what um, even my elite level lifters will do. Sometimes I'll give them five or six, but it's mostly, uh, they'll spend their other days doing recuperation stuff. So we treat those as basically workouts too. I mean, and to me, for a really high level lifter, the, those days of rest are really important as well. Yeah, so, all right. Uh -huh. Well, and, and so when we talk about the vision of where American weightlifting will be going in the next quad, I, my, my main comment would be that um, we're all going to have to make some adjustments um, because of this requirement that is going to be implemented if you're trying to get someone on an Olympic team. Um, I'm going to make the comment based on that because I think that's where we're going to see the most um, kind of effect of, of otherwise people will be able to do things in the same way. Um, but for those who are trying to make the Olympic team, this requirement that they compete at, you know, these three major competitions within this 18 month. So you're going to have three, six month cycle, six, three, six month periods um, that in which you have to compete in um, several competitions. Each period is going to leave, um, what is it? Six total. You're gonna, it's going to require then that athletes compete more internationally than they've been accustomed to. To be and eligible for an Olympic team. To be eligible to, for an Olympic slot, yeah. But how about, is there going to be a different eligibility requirement for Pan Ams and world teams? Well, I mean, you'll still have to qualify for those. I mean, and, and that's what I don't know yet because I wasn't invited to the coaches camp where they discussed all of that even though I had the number four lifter on the Pan Am team, for some reason, I was overlooked. Um, I'm not going to even go into the details of that, but um, for all those people who feel like, you know, oh, I'm a member of USA Weightlifting, and sometimes I'm not treated very well. I happen to have a member who was uh, on the last world team and as a reserve and the Pan Am team as a reserve from last year and was sitting number four and is actually on the Pan Am team and was preparing for an international cup, and I was not invited to the coaches summit that was held to give all of the coaches information about the qualification process. And even though I'm the president of the federation, I still wasn't invited as 
uh, a coach of an elite athlete to find out all that information, Greg. So I guess I'm going to find out. Um, mm. I need to read the reports that came out of that meeting because I was not given, or I have to go online and read about it. Um, and otherwise, fair, I don't know. Do you really think your little woman brain could have understood it all? Oh, shut up. <laughs> Uh, yeah. fucking shit. But I'm not upset about that at all. Uh, clearly. Clearly you have moved past that. I'm over it. It's not eating you up 24 hours a day, no matter what else you're doing. No. But no, that would piss me off too. But anyway, uh, back to Steven's question. But I don't, I mean, I do have worried. questions about what their intent is um, uh, on that. And there, are, there is information well, online. Um, the, the, the Olympic team eligibility thing makes sense. Like you should have to have a certain amount of international experience. Although there well, has to be really a balance. You can't on, on force people. these people to do major competitions every six weeks and then expect them to be in the best shape of their lives for the most important competition of their lives. That doesn't make sense. For the, yeah. For the international perspective, a lot of that's premised on keeping them in a register testing pool. So as we saw before, you could see that they were trying to do that before by saying you had to compete in, you know, like the last year and a half going into that. Um, you had to have X number of international competitions. Remember that? You had to have like yeah. three international competitions to be eligible for the Olympics. Yeah. Well, people were squeezing them all into the six months before the Olympics. So it fell flat on its face. So now they have done it in a way that it requires more. And it's been spread out the 18 months prior to the Olympics. So it's a way um, to ensure that you don't have people popping out of the woodwork at the last minute and trying to make get on a national team uh, without being in the register, you know, in Adam's whereabouts. Uh, right. So you don't get to go Adam. get freaking sauce to the gills for eight years and then pop out and go to Olympic trials three months before it's not, and make it's the team. It's not aimed at U.S. lifters. It's really an international strategy to uh, prevent... Uh, it's, a, it's an international anti-doping strategy to try to have those people in those testing pools earlier on. A gotcha. And the requirement to be in the testing pool four months prior to an international competition then falls into play. Right. And it keeps them in testing pools longer. So as an anti -do international anti-doping strategy... Um, you can see why that's in place and it makes sense from a competition strategy for a coach. It creates some complexity and how are we going to program and prepare for these competitions? And the thing is they're not going to take the results from all of these competitions necessarily when they figure in your ranking, they're going to take the, your top four results. So they're the internationally. Yeah, so, I mean, you'll be able to train through some of them, assuming that you can, you know, make the team, but for the international purposes, yes, but if that then is left to see what are, what is the American um, selection process going to look like in terms of us creating ranking lists, and those are things that I still think have to get flushed out. Um, you know, are we going to if somebody goes and trains through an international competition doesn't have a, a great meet or doesn't produce as high results as they as they have in the past, is that going to then just affect how they're looked at for the next international meet. And that's something that we'll have to take into consideration and understand that we have to send athletes to these international competitions. They have to meet the criteria, but to expect them to perform at a high level at every single competition may be expecting too much. Yeah. Well, that's, that's not going to work. And, and that's, that's why it's important to have people in positions um, when they're making, when they're looking at this, that are actual coaches that understand weightlifting, yeah. right? Yes, I'm that just, would make a lot of sense. That would help to have in these administrative positions people from the sport of weightlifting that understand coaching elite athletes in weightlifting. Yes, imagine that. Imagine being uh, suited for your position. And being competent and experienced. What a what a novel thought. All right. Well, getting back to Stephen's question here about the methodologies. Um, I, the biggest thing I would say with with you know this idea of of what is the American weightlifting philosophy or method, and that is that there isn't one, and that's the great thing is um, we don't have a centralized national system that is educating coaches 
in a very regimented, uh, uniform way. Uh, you know, we're not churning out coaches through a schooling system. Um, to be quite honest, you know, 99% of the USA weightlifting coaches you talk to will tell you that they, they didn't and don't learn anything from the USA weightlifting education program. And I hate to say that, but that unfortunately is a reality and maybe that'll change in the future, but likely not because we don't have a centralized system and none of us can fucking agree on anything. Um, so you're never going to have a, a systematic curriculum, uh, that pleases everybody. So in other words, you have not only coaches who come from completely different educational and experiential backgrounds, coaching weightlifters, but we have an incredibly diverse population of athletes and diverse, uh, you know, from everything from their uh, uh, sporting background. So, you know, what activities they did prior to weightlifting, if any, uh, the age they begin weightlifting. Um, you know, the accessibility they have to weightlifting, whether they're training, you know, two days a week or they're training nine sessions a week. Um, you know, then you have, of course, uh, the genetic variation that you don't see in, in say like, um, you know, a country like China where it's a much more homogenous population and within their athletes. And so they have, things can be very, um, you can just have a straight up system across the board that, that it's a little more effective. So I think the biggest thing with American weightlifting is that it has to be very flexible um, and very much um, kind of modified person to person. And it's, it's not as easy to just have a, a program. You know, this idea that a, a, a coach has a program, I never understood that really. Um, I've always written different programs for all of my, you know, national level lifters because it always seemed to me that it would actually end up being more work to try to write a single program and then end up spending all this time every single day changing things for each athlete because they didn't work. Um, and so, you know, just as an example within my own team, I've got, you know, one girl right now who squats to heavy singles every single day of the week um and and you know does a lot of pretty heavy snatch and clean and jerk very frequently and that works well for her uh, and i've tried other approaches with her you know kind of a more russian approach and it just didn't work for her she didn't get stronger she was always hurt um it just was awful and then this approach works really well i have other people who definitely use more of a russian approach where it's a little more uh, systematic and progressive over time where, you know, we're working not necessarily based strictly on percentages, but more like that approach, um, you know, where we're, we're spending more time kind of building up. And like Ursula said, even with that heavy single girl I'm talking about, it's the, the program is still periodized. We have different periods or phases where we, we have different uh, emphases. And, and so we have slightly different exercises or different variations um, you know, different levels of volume and intensity, that sort of thing. Um, but really my point is that to be an American weightlifting coach and be successful, I think you have to be willing to use whatever works with each athlete at any given time. You can't be wed to a, a certain methodology or philosophy. Like I use Chinese programming. I use Russian programming, which are pretty similar. Uh, or I use Bulgarian programming because you're going to encounter lifters for whom that method does not work well, or at least doesn't work well enough. And so if you're willing to experiment and, um, you know, be kind of open to trying different things with each athlete to discover what works best for them, that's how you're going to get your best results. And it can be kind of a pain in the ass. Um, and you end up kind of scratching your head and, and wondering what the hell else you try when, when, you know, the first three things aren't working well, but you know, if ideally you're working with these athletes for a period of years. And so you, you spend that first short period of time kind of figuring out. And then the rest of the time is, is refining that basic program rather than completely reinventing it each time, you know, every 12 to 20 weeks. Um, and so I do think that, uh, you know, relative to say, you know, Chinese, Russian, Bulgarian programs, you know, the way we, the, kind of the archetype of those programs, 
um, you know, the American variations obviously have to be pared down somewhat. Um, you know, we're not going to be doing the same amount of volume. We're not, we're not going to have a lifter. Even an elite American weightlifter is not going to be doing like 900 reps a week. Uh, it's, it's just not going to happen. Um, and you have, uh, we have to be much more aware of the effect of our programming on our athletes. We have to be much more careful about injuries because we don't have a stack of potential lifters lined up behind our stars ready to take their place if we break them. Um, you know, we don't have, I don't have a mob of 3,000 lifters begging to get in my gym. I don't have any. I, you know, I got to work with what I've got and make each one of those lifters as good as I possibly can. And again, that requires being flexible and being creative and being willing to try Russian style stuff and Bulgarian style stuff and Chinese style stuff. So like Ursula, I use all of it to some extent and in, you know, in different times with different people, I definitely tend to use more of a Russian type approach, um, particularly really when we're talking about, you know, preparatory phases or conditioning phases. And then I will tend to get into more of a Bulgarian style approach in that competition preparation phase, uh, where we do, we go to heavy singles, you know, two to four days a week or something like that. A lot of times we will use waves. Um, you know, we'll work up to a heavy single, you know, back down, you know, whatever, 10 to 15% work back up. We might do that three times. Uh, in a single session, kind of depending on the lifter. Uh, I use, you know, Joe Mills on the minute stuff all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I use that quite a bit and I, I find it really, really effective. And that's, I mean, that's about as American as, as weightlifting methodology gets. Uh, so literally, you know, like we, if I go on a podcast, I, the, the classic question is like, well, tell me what your coaching philosophy is. Like, I don't fucking know what my coaching philosophy is. I don't, I don't know that. I haven't like codified some weird philosophy. Uh, it's really just like, I want to make lifters good. That's my philosophy. And so whatever I can do within the parameters I'm working with, which of course means no drugs, probably someone who has a job and or obligations outside of the gym and can't just train full time professionally. Um, and who probably came to the sport too late, uh, you know, relatively to what would be ideal, at least, uh, you know, who has all these other, you know, former injuries and things like that to work around, I'm going to do whatever I possibly can uh, to make them as good as possible, even if that means doing some weird stuff that maybe, you know, a, a Russian PhD in weightlifting would look at and go like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever seen. Why would you do that? It's like, well, I don't fucking know, but it's working. Uh, so that's my coaching philosophy is, does it work? Yes. Well, let's keep doing it. Does it not work? No, let's stop doing it and pretend that we never tried it because it's stupid. Uh, I don't know. Does that make any sense? Yeah, but I think it's funny that you said I don't have a coaching philosophy and then you defined your coaching philosophy and methodology to, for that to, matter. To call that a definition is pretty well, fucking generous. But it's true. But it, it, no, but that it's was true. a rambling I mean, discourse. I mean, it's, base, it's basically that success is, success is based on the longevity and individualization. Well, and that's you where... That sounds better. Yeah, well, that's what you said. I mean, even though I say y'all all the time, I can't wow. summarize. Um, I just and that, make you know, y'all better at be, weightlifting. That's right. And, it's, and that it's results-based. You know, and the trial and error is fine. And those are some of the things that I usually talk about in my, my course. Like the thing is everybody wants – and I, and I have a basic methodology, but I'm not married to any one thing. And the methodology allows for expansion. And that's what, you know, we generally – I think that's where Greg and I and some of our other – I you know, I, I, I call them colleagues. That seems so generous. Um <laughs> my brothers in the sport and sisters in the sport now like where we agree um and i think from our generation and i'm a little bit older than them by like a decade but um where we all kind of overlap is that we've um what we've learned from our that those our coaches is that we you know we were of the generation that was being introduced to all of the science um 
that was coming in from all of the different countries and where there was an explosion in some of the countries like in China because they didn't really, the males in China didn't really hit the scene until the mid-90s. Um, like at the 95 Worlds, I think is where they first started bringing home medals. Before that, they were substandard uh, in the male ranks. And, um, you know, we started looking at the different methodologies. Like I think we were the generation that got that was really introduced where science was heavily emphasized. And we start um, we started being able to study weightlifting um, from that perspective. Um, I think we were we were we got really lucky in that. But one of the things that we learned very quickly is um, because that's when USADA also was created that we're going to have to do things uh, drug free. And so it doesn't matter what people are importing to us in terms of methods. We're going to have to figure out a way to look at what they're doing and their, uh, with their successes and uh, apply those with a population that is um, not one specific nationality without the recruitment methodologies that they have at their disposal and the populations that they have at their disposal with no sporting school system. Um, with very small population of, pra of practitioners in both the coaching ranks and the athletes ranks. So how are we going to do this? And I think in that regard, as much uh, criticism as, as American coaches have gotten, we've actually become better at being able to do that because we've had to, um, because we didn't have any of those particular circumstances. And I think it's one of the reasons we can take uh, general population um, and, and transfer athletes and other types of athletes and turn them into good weightlifters. Uh, I, I'll be interested in seeing if when all of those perks of the other uh, schools of, of, of weightlifting in other countries, um, when they don't have those basic perks that they've had, like national training centers and systems and schools and all of that go away, how they're going to manage to continue to succeed without the drugs, without the sports schools, without all that, we'll find out um, as those things disappear, whether they're able to continue to be uh, the top countries or if the, the, the lessons that we've learned by not having all of those things will actually bear fruit for us. Um, and in fact, people will start to recognize that the, the, the breadth of knowledge that we've had to acquire because of the experimentation we've had to engage in um, will actually long-term benefit what, you know, the American lack of system, um, which in, in fact is a, a system of in individualization and application of other systems as needed. And a broader study, because we've had to study a bunch of different systems to try to figure out what parts of each of the different methodologies that come from other countries can we potentially use in different cases. It means you have to broaden your knowledge beyond just one system well and you can't use anything straight out of the box no. you know you, you can't go to the russian manual necessarily and just you know yeah. with throw how, one of those programs how. at your lifter um you know it's interesting if you look at you know you look at the 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 classification the soviet classification levels i guess it's russian now i shouldn't say soviet that's yeah. long gone but the, the the classification levels and then you have you know kind of corresponding um volume prescriptions and and programming recommendations and if you take an american lifter who is at whatever you know classification you know candidate for master of sport or master of sport and you give them programming that aligns with that level it's by and large way too much um they can't handle it because they don't have that you know long you know systematically progressive uh background of um uh, athletic development that you get with um you know the ability to recruit at a young age and, and have that system that you pump these kids through until they become specialized weightlifters. Um, and, and so it's, you really have to learn how to, like you said, figure out, um, kind of understand the theme of things or understand the principles of things and learn how to change the application to suit the, the people that you're working with and the circumstances you're working with. So I do think it, it does make you a better coach. Um, because you do have to be able to actually understand the information 
um, in order to change it properly and apply it properly versus just being able to be handed okay here's your workbook and here's you know level three two one um, you know and, and CMS master sport IMS there you go you're done um, it, it's it's a lot more demanding it's a lot more frustrating but it's also a lot more rewarding I guess in the long term if you ever get it right I'm still trying well and I think with um, beginner athletes and maybe even um, intermediate athletes you can you can get away with like uh, a any program is probably going to be a program that's going to progress them to a certain point. I think once you get to the elite levels, then you're really starting to manipulate variables in a different way. Yeah. I know, like you know, Derek, we can't we can't um, do a lot of volume on squats. His knees will inflame. Yeah. You know, so we're we're kind of having, and he's been breaking PR squats, um, you know, pretty periodically, like for the last year or so. Um, and there was a period we had to back off and we saw that affect his clean and jerk and now we're, we're able to come back up and so I'm hoping that the clean and jerk is going to come back up um, in response to that so we're finally back up on the squats we haven't really uh, been able to push to see or to rest long enough to see if that's going to um, or and it should show in the clean and jerk here soon um, but it, it's you know it's there's a modification that has to be made for that specific individual so that we can, so that the, the sports career has, you know, longevity and, and real results in weightlifting are born of longevity. Right. And knowing that, um, once you get to about year six or seven, uh, you need to start making sure that you're, you're preparing for those things. I think you can get, uh, you know, you can kind of progress along until you get to that year and then you'll see some stagnation and that's when you really got to step in and say okay now it's time to look at what you absolutely you have to look at your specific needs not to say that you didn't need to do that before but you know once you get to that period of stagnation at a national or international level it becomes um even more important uh that you prevent injury and that you um work in a way that is uh, focused on individual modification to ensure a consistent uh, increase in results over time because you're, you're managing year by year and you're, you're looking at peaking and trying to peak in Olympic years in terms of results. Yep, I'm getting ready for 2020 as we speak. That's why we I'm all so, are. That's why I'm so bad at lifting now is I don't want to peak too far. Oh, you are. You are. Oh, I thought you meant four-year athletes. <laughs> Me. Uh, oh, you. I'm sorry. I'm not laughing. Just kidding. Thank God <laughs> yeah, I'm not. me too. Masters, <laughs> whatever. God, Here we come. Holy shit. You know, be embarrassing. You know, next, you know, next year, um, it, I turn 50. I'm sorry. <laughs> Are you saying I'm sorry? Like you're sorry that I'm so old or you're sorry that for the other 50 year olds? <laughs> or no, the other, you're not going to be hanging out with other 50 year olds. They're going to be too well, lame for you. No, I'm um I'm looking for some 50 year old friends if I can find some. Um, I think they generally don't like me. When I've shown up to masters meets, I've generally felt unwelcome. <laughs> Why do you think that is? Probably because I'm going to beat them. And that's my attitude. <laughs> there you go. That's why it is right there. A bad attitude. Throw your shit down like this is my platform, bitches. Back off. <laughs> um, why don't you? Why don't I, you go stand over there and just watch me get your medal? I've seen. I know. It's, I shouldn't be so arrogant. There's some really, really good masters. There are some pretty that, freaking there are good some masters fucking, out there right yeah, now. Yeah, and those bitches train for real. They don't fuck around like me. I'm like two weeks and I'm coming, and then you know. I, yeah, that's I, I can be super. <laughs> your, your periodization is two days conditioning phase, three yes. days strength phase, two days power phase, one day <laughs> competition prep. We're ready. Yeah. It's really bad. Well, I can't do conditioning phase because then everything starts to hurt. Like I can't do reps because my elbow my elbow hurts before I start to begin with, and then if I do too many reps, my wrists start to hurt. And then if I do, yeah, and then I'm, I get tired. So I'm just like, you know what? I'm just going to go to the meet. 
I was gonna say, I think you should just go to a meet and not train at all. Just see what you can pull out of your butt. I've basically done that, so I just, you know, want to make sure, like, I remember how to snatch and that I can get my elbows around on a clean. And I'm like, okay, I'm good. Let's not do anything more than that. I don't want to, you know, waste my energy. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. You don't want to be all tired going into a meet from training. <laughs> I've got to figure this thing out, how I'm, going to, how I'm going to train at this age, but I'm going to do it again. I was training for a little while. I got kind of – it's just hit or miss. Right, right now, I've just been running around. I'm going to do it again, y'all. I'm going to do it. Somebody somebody make me accountable. All right. Yeah, well, okay, yeah. As soon Whatever. as I can start training again, maybe yeah. I'll be I'll stay on you. But right now, I can't do jack shit. All right, guys. Well, uh, I guess we'll put out another one of these in 2 to 20 weeks. <laughs> de- depending on what world world tour not... adventures Ursula decides ooh, to get ooh, up to. Ooh, ooh, what's today? I don't even know the date. Today's the 14th. Okay. Um, of March. We have, we have board meetings coming up. That sounds boring. No one cares. They do. Nope. Just about the results. Board. Yeah, well, it's something. Maybe we'll know something that, that is, um, will be divulged to the public. Divul- maybe I'll have some divulgable. Potentially. Yeah, maybe we'll have some discussion about it. All right. We'll I don't know. see. Wait, it's a preliminary wait. Question. No, here I'm just I'm just saying this outright. I'm not discussing new weight classes until I know what they are. I this whole everybody like wringing their hands and pulling their hair and arguing. Yeah, no, and no, I'm in the same place. I'm in the same place. And, and same speculating place. and pontificating. Who yeah. gives a shit? They're gonna be what they are, and as soon yeah. as I find out what they are, me and all my athletes will adjust accordingly and then move on with our lives. Like, why, yeah, why are we investing people, so much time you're thinking either, about it? You're either in your class, which you're probably not, or it's above you or below you. That's yeah. all I know. <laughs> exactly. It's definitely going to be I'm one of those three. So <laughs> rest easy. You you pretty much know what's coming. And the other thing, too, is that it's not going to be oh, like yeah. your weight class changes nine kilos you know what I mean? Like, let's all. Well, there's going to be breath. ten, so there's going to be more. Exactly. And only seven are in the Olympics, so you're either really lucky or you're fucked. But. Well, and you know what though? Those weight, those seven Olympic weight classes. How many people in USA weightlifting is that going to affect? Yeah, it's true. Exactly. It's so true. let's not freaking yeah. lose our minds over it. I mean, hasn't wrestling done that for years now? Yes. They've had different yes. weight classes, so yes. they've figured it out. We can figure it out. Yeah. Yeah, it's the change that people freak out about. But I just think it's the anticipation, like you know, anything. I think and people, you know, they just gotta have gotta have something to talk about, Greg. And I tell, I can people, think about like, so many things me, I would rather ask. talk about than like <laughs> imagined things, weight classes. Things, yeah, things that you can't do anything about. Well, and, I'm you gonna, know, it's, I'm gonna spend hours of my day coming up with a chart of what I think the perfect weight classes would be. So that no one can use them. <laughs> Come on. So that everyone can disagree. Go and mow they your lawn or true. something. Like, do something useful. Oh, what they should be, in my opinion. Yeah. No, I um, Yeah, I'm just going to wait to see what that's, what Niku and his sports committee come, come up with. And then um, see what kind of discussion. It's going to be interesting, though. I want to see the back and forth. Because I am sure, what I am sure of is that everybody is going to, not everybody, but a lot of people are going to have their opinion and that they're going to be 100% sure that their opinion is the correct one. Oh. And that's always fun to watch. Speaking of what the American weightlifting uh, methodology is, it's having an opinion and sharing it. <laughs> that's what we do better than and anyone in the world. And treating it like fat. Yeah. Every yeah. Hey, I agree. Everyone is entitled to their wrong opinion. Uh, okay. All right. Seriously, let's get let's let's end this thing. <laughs> let's let's put this fucking episode out of its misery. 
All right, guys. Uh, seriously, thank you for listening. I'm really sorry that we can't get these things out regularly. Maybe one day we'll get back on a schedule. Maybe they're maybe they're not as sorry after this episode. Maybe it's, they're like, well, it's probably better just one a month. It's quite possible that that will be the consensus. Uh, but I'm going to assume... But if it's not, they can go say something positive, right? Somewhere? Exactly. I don't know Exactly. Yeah, you can go to iTunes or whatever you listen on and hit the little five star button and if you really have a spare 10 seconds after you hit five stars you can go type a little thing and tell all the people who don't listen to this show yet how great it is and how much they'll enjoy listening to it uh we really appreciate that as much as we are really not we it's more like me uh bitch and moan about this thing uh we do get a lot of really positive feedback. I know there's a lot of you out there who really love it. So we're going to keep doing yeah, it as long you. as we can possibly make it work. Yeah. I really do drive Greg crazy. And I'm sorry, Greg. I don't mean to. You're not it's sorry. unintentional. I don't believe that for one second. I just can't help it. <laughs> it's, it's just natural. It's completely our, our, uh, our natural chemistry is for me to get on Greg's nerves. I wish I could say that it's part of your charm, but it's not. It is. It is. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you for listening uh, to our irregular monthly podcast at this point. And uh, we'll talk to you next time, hopefully before uh, the next Olympics. All right. So pessimistic. All right. Bye. <laughs>